Hey, what's up everyone and welcome to the MindTrace podcast episode number three. I'm your host Ajmal Savari and today we'll look into the UX of cocktails and bars with our guest Ivar. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the MindTrace podcast. In this podcast, we're bridging the gap between science and its application in UX. We're having conversations with guests from these two worlds, all with the aim of figuring out the UX of certain industries, how UX can use scientific discoveries, what UX industries can learn from each other, and what questions UX has for science. Our guest today is Ivar De Lange. Ivar is an award-winning bartender and entrepreneur with a background in medical psychology. For his bartending skills, he has been awarded first place at the Maker's Mark Mixology Sessions, NBC National Championships, Roses Cup Netherlands, Diageo World Class Netherlands, Diageo World Class Western Europe Speed Round. He was also within the top 10 at IBA World Championships, Roses Cup Europe, Diageo World Class Global Finals. On top of that, he also received the Golden Bowtie Award for Best Bartender by the Dutch Hospitality and Spirit Industry. Now he helps clients to design bars, menus, train staff and much more. He also works at Lucas Bowles as the Global Education Manager and as Master Bartender. In our conversation, we talk about the cocktail and bar experience, how the industry is set up and where it could go. We also touch upon the impact Ivar's medical psychology background had on his bartending career. At the end, he also mentions specific questions he has for science. You can find Ivar at his personal website, ivardelange.com. That is I-V-A-R-D-E-L-A-N-G-E dot com. Enough background. Let's get into it, shall we? Thanks so much for taking the time. Absolute pleasure. It's, uh, it's a beautiful Friday today and we're sitting inside. Well, I think it's a bit too windy still. That's but true. it is a beautiful Friday, it especially is a beautiful for Friday. A Dutch uh, standards. Especially for Dutch standards. <laughs> well, we're in beautiful, I want to say Amsterdam, but that's not true. Just outside of Amsterdam. Just outside Zandam. Zandam. Yes. Yes. In your beautiful house. Thank you. Um, so today, what we are going to talk about is the UX of cocktails or beverages in general and bars, bar designs. And uh, I mean, we, we can see where this all goes, uh, depending on, on what you say. I'm definitely not the expert here, and that's why you're here. But, you know, <clears throat> I have a personal curiosity question. I don't think I ever asked you this question before, and I should have, since all this time we know <laughs> each other. Well, okay, maybe you wouldn't have told me that either. Well, let's see. Okay, so my personal curiosity question is, what is the limit for a very high quality spirit mm -hmm. to be used in a cocktail uh, until you can't taste that out anymore, in, uh, actually? So let's say I would... I love to, in your, in your old bar, I always used to order the Cuba Libre. Uh, people say, oh, that's super easy to make, but I didn't come across many places where that actually did taste as good as at your place. And I always ordered it with the Havana Club three-year-old. Now, I know some people have told me, no, no, you should order this with the Havana Club eight-year-old. And then others went up and up and up. Is there a limit? Well, for, there is, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I come across a lot of uh, aficionados, so to say, and, yeah. and, and rum is still okay. But when you touch whiskey, mm -hmm. there's, there's like people who say, don't mix my whiskey. So mm -hmm. even a drop of water would be, mm -hmm. would be too much. Where is, blasphemy. Sorry? Almost blasphemy. For them, it for is. Them, for, for them, them it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's I've seen a lot of change there in the t past 20 years. Now more and more people say, okay, it's it's good to mix. And um, this is also what I think to answer your question, I can I can use that whiskey example. If you do mm -hmm. it properly, if you do it properly, then you enhance the character of that spirit. So if you have a beautiful 
uh, let's take an, an Isle, which is a very mm -hmm. smoky whiskey, 16 year, beautiful Isle 16. And you know how to, to uh, pay homage to the character of the Lagavulin 16 and really enhance the flavors, maybe pair or match them in a beautiful way, then that's a perfect cocktail. Mm -hmm. Um, and the same goes for that, that Cuba Libra. If you take a Havana 3 with a bit more nutty character, small vanilla notes, and you add a Coke to that, it's a great combination. Yet, if you take a Rum Agricole, which is often not aged, and it is from pure juice, which has more apple, grassy notes, and you mix a Coke, you get a completely different drink, mm -hmm. and you need to change the balance. So if you would have ordered a let's say a, a Havana 7. Huh? If you would have ordered that, I might have changed the balance with the Coke and the, and the lime. So is there a limit? No, but it takes somebody that's um, experience. with experience mm -hmm. or educated as a, as a bartender. Or people like to talk about mixologists, yeah. which I think, which is very difficult with that. Uh, you know, you sort of insult scientists if, if you say that there's there is people try to put science into bartending which in my opinion is very very difficult um but you know a, a good bartender or mixologist um <coughs> knows how to use the proper amount of, of coke and balances it out according to your choice of rum and might also say yeah okay this is a rum agricole that's so grassy you might not want to mix this with Coke, but what about taking a dark and stormy with ginger beer? That's a better combination. Oh, wow. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's, uh, so from the, well, the, the consumer end, because I really have, I, I wouldn't know how to mix any of these things just because I like the training. It makes a lot of sense that you say, well, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have the higher level drink, of course, the flavors are different. And then if you want to, it should be accent, accentuating those flavors, right? Finding the yeah. right accents. And so, of yeah. course, if you were to stick to exactly the same, let's say, I don't, I don't, I don't know how much milliliters of Coke goes in a normal <laughs> Cuba Libre, but let's say it's 40 milliliters and normally the alcohol is uh, 20, that you then expect just by changing the alcohol, but not the entire let's say composition, no. the recipe, just a better experience. Like, ah, okay, so that's not how it works. No. You really have to know, know these details about these drinks to then mix them together in a way. Uh, but that means also you need to trust the bartender a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. And, and this is also, in my opinion, where we're well-trained bartenders separate themselves from untrained bartenders. I always say you don't put a Ferrari engine into a Fiat Punto because the Fiat Punto will explode. A Fiat true. Punto needs a different engine. And yeah. the same goes for cocktail. You can't just, you know, take ingredients and, and, and mix them out. So let, let's take a, a mojito, which is a very popular drink. Um, I make almost every mojito different for each, each sort of rum. Uh -huh. So you can adjust that. But that makes sense. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been on my mind for years. <laughs> and it actually has led to many, many discussions amongst uh, yeah. friends. I mean, uh, you know how it goes. Everyone has uh, an opinion course, about this. Of course. But I mean, if it's in the end, if somebody, if one one person at the, let's say you are the, at, a, at a higher end uh, cocktail bar and one person at the table orders a Cuba Libre with eight-year-old rum, somebody orders it with three-year-old rum, they would say, oh, look, this tastes better. And yeah. they, because they have no idea what the bartender did, they would just all blame it on the rum. Right? Probably, so and, and often <clears throat> it's, but I, I, it's, it's also, I think it's also, this goes further, obviously. I think if you chose that older age rum in your mind, because, mm -hmm. you know, bartending, especially flavors, it's, it's also, it's a lot, very suggestive. Very, yeah, it's very, yeah. it's, it's all about the experience. Yeah. And if, if you think that eight-year-old rum will be better, then probably that eight-year rum will be better. But it's also probably because that eight-year rum has more of more because of the longer aging, more chocolate, more vanilla notes that you might like. Whereas a three-year-old might be more nutty, which you know brings out different flavor in your Coke as well. So that's right. yeah. There is a uh, there uh, for me as a bartender it was always 
you know, I made what the guest wanted. Right. But the moment they started ordering very expensive whiskey and added Red Bull, you know, I frowned. Yeah. But it, as a bar owner, it made me money. Sure. Um, but if it comes to Red Bull, this, yeah, then if you're, if you're, if there's so much sugar in a, in a product and such a strong flavors, yeah, those, those details sort they of go lost. away. So if, like the same goes for orange juice. Right. Orange juice is the acidity, but the sweetness of orange juice, you know, the, the nuances become smaller and smaller. Yeah. Yeah. I think when it comes to sugar, I hear often, yeah, it's a, it, it amplifies the flavors. Then I often think yeah, yeah, but there must be a limit because if you, otherwise you would just eat sugar, yeah, right? No, but that's not how it works. <laughs> And there is an absolute like, like an amplifier, I guess. Yeah. Right? It just goes up, and at some point, the speakers will be clipping. Yeah, and then, yeah. It, then yeah, you don't get anything. No, there's also with in a sense, it's also with coke, rum, and coke. Hmm. If you just add a shit, shitload, part of my French. <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> this is an explicit of... podcast, by the way. I should have told you in the beginning. You don't have to watch your language here. <laughs> okay, but if you if you just add a lot of coke, you'll be drinking coke. Yeah. Which is which is okay, but yeah. but that's not where you go why right. why you go to a bar. Yeah. No. It's too much sugar. So just to back paddle a little bit. Um so obviously I, I now you see this piece of paper in front of me. I did my research and I found out lots about you that oh I didn't know before. Uh, did, lots of me that I didn't know as no, well. No, or? no, no, no. It's, I think lots <laughs> of I, I hope lots of you that you knew. No, I'm actually quite sure, but lots of the things that I didn't know. So I actually thought that that your cocktail bar that you had in Nijmegen where we met was your your first bartending experience, but I only now realized like that was completely not true. No. You already had experience in uh, in Amsterdam already, no. I think. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about your your experience trajectory? So I started it behind the bar when I was fifteen. Um, well. Two weeks before I was 16. Okay. 16 was allowed, yeah. 15 not yet. Okay. But I worked in a hotel just outside of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. um, a Van der Valk hotel, which is a big Dutch chain. And they're not known for treating their staff. Um, they're, 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 not, they're no Google, let's call it that okay. way. <laughs> the, the HR is... A <laughs> well, anyway, I... But I, I was on the floor serving in a in a restaurant and I hated it and I dropped stuff. And then the, the manager, she, she said, why don't you jump behind the bar? We need somebody. And after two months, I was running the bar by myself um, wow. for a 500 uh, restaurant. So uh, wine, beer and mixed drinks and some easy cocktails. And I really enjoyed that. So that, that was sort of the start here. And then... When I was 18, I graduated high school and I stopped the bartending part, but I started traveling, worked in some small bars. And then when I got back, I started studying in Nijmegen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, that's where I also got back behind the bar, uh, at a bar called Sterre, mm -hmm. where we ran the cocktail program, my later business partner and I. Yeah. Uh, we ran the cocktail program. And that's, that's really where I got the... Um, the virus, so to say, yeah. we had the privilege. Um, you were infected. Yes, and we had the luck that that um, at a certain point we we were making some of the cocktails, and then the bar was bought by another owner, and he he gave us a lot of freedom, but also education, mm. and that's and for me that's still a super valuable. Yeah, exactly. This is. And and it's 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 very funny because the the hospitality scene has a, a big image problem um, here in the Netherlands. Oh really? Least. Yeah, nobody really wants, especially we're a knowledge economy. Everybody yeah. in the Netherlands gets an education, gets a diploma, and then right. says, "Well, I'm not going to work in a bar." Right. And it makes sense because it's night work. It's it's highly underpaid relatively uh, because physically it's demanding. It's in a sense dangerous mm -hmm. uh, at night work and stuff like that. <laughs> so it had. Um, it's sort of a bad reputation, but the main thing for me is that it lacks, lacks an educational path. There is no carrot, as I call it. So you're a bartender and then you want to go up. So you're a notary or you're a, uh, in, in the Dutch, you're a candidat, so you're a oh, yeah, student yeah. notary, and, blah, blah, yeah. blah, and then your partner and then you own your firm and stuff like that. That's missing. 
So you're a bartender, then maybe a bar manager. Then you got to own your own bar, but bar owners don't own a lot of money. So no, not everybody does. And that... But um, I guess even I guess even when you have your own bar, you're kind of expected to be behind the bar. Exactly. So it, even though exactly. maybe you go through these stages, your workplace doesn't change. No. And we say there's a dead saying, uh, or I maybe it's a saying. I think uh, it's a saying. <laughs> I made up a saying. But no, one bar is no bar. I see. So, uh, on average, net profit in a bar is eight to twelve percent. Okay. Uh, so if your revenue is uh, half a million. It's It's quite a lot. That's quite a lot. Uh, you still, and often then there's two owners, you still only make 40,000 yeah. split in two, that's 20,000, but then tax, pension. So that leaves about 900 to 1,000 euros a month. So you work very hard and yeah. then you got to open more and more bars. Yeah. So, um, so because it's, it's, it really is very labor intense. Absolutely. You get 100 to, hours. Yeah. It's all, a week. it all has to be made by hand. It's not yeah. just like, Hey, no. Cuba Libre out the tap. No, <laughs> no, well, you have to, you have to make Well, you can do it on tap now, but you have to make it. And the problem there is that since there's no education, it's seen as a student job. So oh. you also, people leave after an hour, a year, half a year, yeah. you've invested in education, the whole thing starts over again. So as an owner, you're constantly um, training new staff, but that education that I got at Stere, where that owner said, okay, you go with the partner to a bar academy for two days. That, mm -hmm. that, that was very valuable for me. And that opened my eyes that there are educational uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of um, uh, when I got my, um, my master's degree, uh, when I was, uh, and then I think it was right after I bought the bar because I, I, I worked in the, at the Radboud. Yeah. Then. You studied psychology, right? Yes. Or was I it did. was a clinical psychology? Clinical psychology. Clinical psychology. Yeah. And I didn't want to. Um, I, I noticed during that because I sort of did an internship and then that turned into work. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, it was quite clear. No, that's not going to be. So then I, I just, um, I we started the bar. All right. No, I got my master. Yeah, yeah. I was finished. Then we bought the bar, but I got the physical diploma because we were painting everything and then. At one o'clock, I believe, I had to pick up my uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of covered in paint. In and paint. my mom came and my brothers <laughs> and, and and the guy, you know, the professor was yeah. giving a speech. Yeah. And he said, well, here's your diploma. But if I just bought a bar, so <laughs> it's like a bit of a, an interesting uh, um, si uh, situation and, and period. But yeah, that's so I started. That's 23 years ago when I oh, started. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And Van der Falk taught me how to work hard. Uh, because, well, as I said, as I said, they're not known for their HR, so for their, um, how do you call it, treating their staff the best. They're not doing anything wrong per se, yeah, but it's yeah. not like, you know, it's hard work and it's demanding. Yeah. And, uh, but it's not like, hey, if you're tired, you can sleep there in the corner. No, 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 no exactly. <laughs> take some food. Not at all. No, 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 not no, at all. No. It's you need to work. Yeah, you need to. You're there to work. And you get minimum wage mm. and you work your ass off. Mm. And if you can do a little better, you do a little better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that, that formed me, that, that, that's been a very, um, very important uh, part of my, uh, my career. That's also probably why my parents allowed me to do that job. I mean, discipline I is important to learn, especially Absolutely. when you start your own thing. Because Absolutely. you can only rely on yourself. Yeah. yeah. And you have to work very very hard so that's that's what i learned and um so van der Volk has been but that especially that, that education at, at stead at that moment that was um so i was thinking okay there could be a profession could be a career so what was it then from from all these experiences that you had that that you had in these previous jobs the the experience from van der Falk, you mentioned okay they taught me to work uh at stere because you got sent to these workshops or or boot camps, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you, you could see, okay, I, I can gain knowledge here. There might be a, a path, but what other things from these jobs helped you to come up with the concept for your own bar? Because it's not just, Ooh. you didn't just open a bar. It, no. it was supposed to be different. Yes. And Absolutely. when I came to Nijmegen and, and when I came, demain, your cocktail bar already existed. It's the only cocktail bar that I knew about when I came to Nijmegen. Yeah. Uh, there was nothing else. No. 
And I thought the mall was very special. I've been to many cocktail bars, but I thought it was very special. Well, people saw, thought we were utterly crazy starting uh, the mall. And we were. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. We were 27. And uh, so being from Amsterdam, I was from Amsterdam during my university years. I sort of spent half the time in Nijmegen, half, half in Amsterdam. And um, so, so, you know, not to be negative about Nijmegen, but especially when I got there 15 years ago, there was a big difference between Amsterdam and Nijmegen. Oh, well, yeah, well, it still is. It still, still is. It still is. <laughs> it still is. <laughs> we shouldn't forget it. Now we have internet. Yeah. yeah. When we started the bar, the man in 2007, eight. Oh, yeah. I, I believe Instagram wasn't there yeah. yet. No, Facebook nothing. just the, started. The iPhone just came out in 2007. So, so, so it was not like you go on the internet and look for cool bars. Now, yeah. if you pop up your Instagram, you see yeah. amazing pictures of the most beautiful bars, stuff like that. But I was very much inspired by, we wanted to create a luxury luxury drinking experience a quality mm -hmm. drinking experience so what we did is we we took about six months i think to write all the plans down mm -hmm. to to really make a concept uh we even did a small research in nijmegen what people wanted all right what, what, yeah we what? went on the street yeah it was and being a psychologist this was there was nothing scientific no but doesn't did. doesn't matter no, often, we, often that doesn't even matter right it's no. just too to get information. To get the information uh, and, and looking back of it, we get were... Get a feel for it. Yeah, but that's we were more looking for confirmation than oh. information, but it's a different thing. No, but it's a slippery slope always. Slippery slope. <laughs> but but we got some valuable information. We, we we just went on the streets, asked, gave forms to about 200 people and uh, really... But people were looking for something new. They were looking for two things. One thing was something to dance. Mm -hmm. That wasn't there around then in Nijmegen. Yeah. Um, and another was sort of a more upscale lu luxury. It wasn't per se cocktails. Yeah. Because cocktails was a very unknown concept. Yeah. People came to Stedda for a pina colada, but yeah. oh, really? okay. like high end cocktails, no. It was... no. So we sat down, we started writing, and we really wanted to do that. Con we believed it was possible. And people say, yeah, but Nijmegen, Havana and the Waal is what they call ah, it, a yeah. left winged. Yeah student city people. I said, there's i don't know 150,000 people yeah for me that's and they're not all students <laughs> they're not all students it's a representation of the dutch of the dutch people maybe slightly more to the left mm -hmm. but but still you know yeah we just need 400 people a weekend to come for a novelty yeah. product to i said that that should be possible yeah in general dutch people and cocktails, because here in Amsterdam, I, I sometimes work at uh, one of the best bars here in town, which is a great opportunity for me. I'm the oldie there, so a couple of shifts a month, but 95%, um, I think, is tourist. Oh, wow. And um, because Dutch people, first of all, they start counting. Yes. So I spend 12 euros on a cocktail. <laughs> that means four beers. It's all right. But that dude, why would I pay 50? They don't do that. Yeah, they don't do that. Unless they want to impress somebody on a date. That's true. And then not even because they got to split the bill. And then they think, yeah, I cannot let her pay that much money. So eh, there, here <laughs> comes the Dutch uh, <laughs> frugalness. All right, I'm, I'm very happy that you're saying all these things and not <laughs> Of course, me. I know. I know I'm done. <laughs> but this is, this is also what I noticed in the... In yeah. the um, um, when I came to the Netherlands, I didn't expect there to be much of a difference between Germany and the Netherlands. But when it came to the service industry, not how the the service was in general, but the the what the customer valued no. uh, was so different what they were willing to pay a premium for. No. And in the Netherlands, I was so surprised they were just not willing to pay a premium no. at all. There is a current... Uh, a current trend that premium spirits everything is about premium spirit you see premium spirit rising everywhere not that much in the netherlands only in amsterdam rotterdam maybe where you have tourists mm. so in nijmegen when we opened it people really said we were we were crazy yeah but what what i also knew is that we we had a sort of a, a a fan base can you call it a fan yeah. base at yeah. Stere, yeah, yeah. and uh, it was a hip spot and we we started spreading the word. And um, when we opened from day one, it was, it was a line outside. And 
uh, we went through a whole learning curve, but we never had to, luckily never had to complain about the volume of people coming to the bar. And it was a big, big gamble. But um, yeah, we, we wanted to have a, a luxury place. And one of the, we had, um, there was a good match. I had a very good friend of mine at that time uh, who is an interior designer, mm -hmm. uh, quite a successful uh, international uh, interior designer currently. And um, he, we were his first project. Okay. Yeah. So he made a beautiful, well, you've seen it. Yeah. What it is. He made a beautiful design of the bar. And he helped us a lot there with uh, with helping us out with material and stuff like that. And um, that was a, a good match. The man wouldn't have looked the way it did if he wouldn't have been there. And we, you know, we have, we were lucky as well to get money from the bank and some of our own money. So um, it wasn't cheap, but we had made it. it was a good good match there. Yeah. So those two things, us deciding we want to have a luxury um, drinking experience and did some research uh, with a bit of the knowledge in the background of cocktails together with having him on board to design uh, the bar and to to help us uh, uh, realize it that that cost for um yeah for demand to be what it was yeah no and i thought Dema was um so I, I didn't know that you actually had an interior designer i actually thought yeah. you guys made that all yourself oh, no, no, no. i was very impressed i mean when you walk <laughs> Uh, just for the, the listeners now, you walk in and it's you don't see a, a giant room with 50 tables all stacked up uh, in like uh, like a grid. It was more like an, um, an elongated um, place where you walk through and you could you could have max somebody on the right side and maybe then a table on the left side and uh, and then walk in between there which I think was great because it still gave the people that were sitting there a big sense of more space and privacy no. uh, to enjoy it with the people that come. But it was not, you know, there was nothing that was actually separating you from any other guest, no. but it, it created this nice perception. And then no. when you get in the back, this elongation changes into a, into a left turn. And then there basically you have a bit more space but you still had that same perception. And oh. I especially, especially enjoyed the fireplace. Yes. I would never thought of putting a fireplace in my own bar and especially not in a golden, because the, yeah. I don't know how you call it exactly, but it was put in a golden wall. We sort of yeah. build a golden wall and a fireplace in the middle so you could see through the fireplace. Yeah. Oh my God, that and, was so uh, beautiful. Yeah. In summer, we couldn't put it on because it was it was an actual fireplace. <laughs> yes. It got so hot in there. It was so hot. Yeah. And sometimes people even came, especially on dates in summer, asking, can you put the fireplace on? Like, nah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, but it was a, the uniqueness. What I think of the design was that it is warmth of the colors. Uh -huh. um, it was several layers. What do I mean with that? So, several heights of sitting. So that's, that oh, gives yeah, that's a very right. layered feeling where you can have both your intimate place uh, where you have a good conversation or you can be with a group, mm -hmm. but still intimately be with that group. And um, yeah, the golden the golden bar of, or with sort of an arch, yeah. I think it was. Yeah, that was, um, that was also, um, also unique. So yeah, it's, it, it shows that um, interior design is not, because you think I'm gonna, and a lot of bar owners that start a bar now think I can do it myself. I would definitely advise to get somebody with expertise because they don't only look at, oh, this is a beautiful chair. Yeah. Or, no, they look at the whole picture, but also on the height of, of the seats, of the whole atmosphere, of the colors. Mm. Um, so, yeah. I mean, other di yeah, I mean, they just think about other dimensions that you might have not considered yet. Exactly. Or, I mean, might have not even thought that no. play a big role. No. The only thing you should always design yourself is the actual bar, the ah. workstation. Yeah. Because uh, architects or interior designers don't think of volume, routing and stuff like that. So that's one thing yeah. you should always Okay. Oh, that's a good design tip. yourself. That would yeah. have been actually my next question. But it makes I, it makes a lot of sense that <laughs> I mean, if you have to stand there, it needs to fit your workflow yeah, exactly. so you can deliver quality yeah. and speed 
yeah. uh, at the same time. So and currently with my company, I get a lot of clients. And my first question when I come to a new client, when they open a new bar or a new place, have you designed the bar yet? 99 out of 100 times a year, yeah, our architect did it. And then I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it's, and what bar owners often forget is, is it the Paratio principle, 80-20? Yeah, 80-20. Yeah, yeah, the Pareto principle. Pareto principle, yeah. yeah. That also goes for bars. Yeah. So in 20% of the time, you make 80% 80 of your revenue. So that's mm. at peak. So that's maybe two hours, three hours. You got to bang out drinks. And if your bar station is not set up for success, mm -hmm. that might cost you four or five cocktails an hour on one station. That's 10 cocktails an hour times 12. So That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's... Uh, quite some money you lose in that yeah. in that um, in that peak that's easily four four or five hundred yeah. euros and, and I mean it's not only that so let's say you were to do this and the the customer is still waiting for those cocktails and in the long run you're just going to lose customers because exactly. they, they don't want to wait yeah. 30 minutes for a drink and that's we had that at the man and you had that at the man yeah in the beginning horror stories in the beginning but you know we and and and, and then think of that eight to twelve percent yeah so then think of that those 500 euros a night you could lose by bad design yeah um that that is very important and and there are also so there's a special i always would advise to hire a specialized interior designer but also somebody that knows about routing about bar about efficiency so you can you know there's we do a lot of calculation but if everybody if you have four people on the floor selling one coke an hour extra that's 10 euros an hour on an eight hour shift, you know, it's, that, it's, that adds up, that adds up on a yeah. yearly basis. Yeah. So it's all these, and if, if they have to go all the way to the bar and there's a small fridge that needs to be restocked three times a night with, co it, it just doesn't, it, you lose money. You lose money. Yeah. Okay. So when you, when you advise, so from <clears throat> the company that you now have, you are advising people that want to open bars. Yeah, or run bars or, or run, or run bars. beverage programs. Is it, for, is it also for like uh, creating cocktail menus or beverage menus? Absolutely. What, what's your, when you do that, what's your specific focus then? I mean, you mentioned already a little bit of, okay, you, you're you making sure um, the owners or the people that want to open it or, or are running it, things are focused on efficiency, but not only just speed, no. right? It's, it, it's not... I, I guess it's not supposed to be McDonald's. No, it's, no, no. It's, yeah, yeah. it's efficiency oh. and quality yeah. at the same time. Um, but what, what other aspects are you thinking then? Uh, what, what's the process that goes uh, so, into it? First of all, I start talking to the owner manager. And my, the first thing I think is how can we create a program that creates healthy revenue and mm. healthy profit? And sometimes, because it's not only often I don't even, well, cocktails is all sort of always involved, but sometimes I also run programs without cocktails because okay. after talking to them, um, we find out that cocktails might not be what they want. I see. Or because it's a lot of work. Yeah. And I always try to manage expectations. And um, if, if I believe that the expectations of a client are unrealistic I, I tell them and i will never do a uh, a project where i think okay this is this is not going to work mm. um, then i step out then i say okay you might look for somebody else to execute uh, because i don't feel comfortable with that so the first step is is really that business program that concept is it feasible is it realistic to do that um it can be anywhere in the country so i been all the way to the south a couple of weeks ago for a cool, cool little project. Um, but you gotta do a different project in the south than in New York, for instance, which oh, yeah. is, okay. is it's, it's completely different. But often that um, bar owner in the south takes New York as an example. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, they do, look, they do look at the at the big ones, right? Oh, exactly, like, I, they, I can I can understand yeah. that. And what's very what's often um, I, I, I often I start asking with sort of why, mm -hmm. the why of the cocktails. If the why of the cocktails is revenue, mm -hmm. because owner think I can ask 10 euro for a cocktail or 250 for a beer. So if I sell as many cocktails as beers, aha. Ah, see. 
So, but then the cost, you know, you, your margin on a cocktail is lower than your beer. So well, I wouldn't per se go for it. But if revenue is the reason, you make a completely different menu. You bang out a, if, if, if image mm -hmm. you can, is, is, is the reason or passion is the reason. Passion, you gotta go on the whole other side. You gotta say, well, of course you can make a beautiful old fashioned with Sakapa 23. Mm -hmm. But you can't put that on a menu because it has to cost 25 euros. Uh, but you know, you have a lot of young bartenders that want to have a crazy bar back bar, and yeah, then you lose money. So, you know, I really I I, I look at revenue, I look at a feasible, uh, realistic project, and I look at the why, mm -hmm. and then we start filling in the pieces. We do calculation, we do service training, we do upsell training, we we really analyze um, the project we we uh, we gonna start with them and that taps yeah you look at a lot of different things oh wow okay that sounds very interesting <laughs> um so i got a bunch more questions in what exactly and specifically also with your background in psychology but we come back to that later of course so now okay this might come a little bit out of the blue i there was no <laughs> no real segue to this <clears throat> But how would you compare a bartender to a kitchen chef? Well, there, the big difference to start with is that often a chef that has no interaction with the guest. Right. So a bartender is always in the spotlights yeah. and is very multitasking. Um, but besides that, a bartender does the exact same. We look at drinks and foods and make a combination that we serve. Uh, a chef does the same. A big difference, obviously, we work with alcohol, which takes a little bit of responsibility and mm -hmm. stuff like that into account. Um, but besides that, everything I see food-wise, I can use uh, in a cocktail. And nowadays, sky's the limit. We use the same techniques as chefs, some of like in the molecular kitchen. Oh, yeah, also, the molecular, yeah. Yeah, we do that a lot, but also um, fat washing, smoking, stuff like that, where you can you can smoke a ham, but you can also smoke a cocktail. So there's a lot of similarities there, but... How can you smoke a cocktail? What, what? Um, so you have a smoking gun. Do you know the smoking gun no. that they use in chef? It's, it's sort of you put, let's say, sandalwood or yeah. apple wood in a smoking gun. You light that you put the smoking gun on that and it, it sucks the so you the, the the wood starts burning yeah and the smoke gets sucked into the smoking gun there's a little hose yeah and you put the cocktail uh, i'm taking a glass but obviously right. the listeners can't see that <laughs> so um you have the cocktail and you put a sort of a glass globe yeah. on top and you smoke you you uh, blow the smoke into the glass and you keep it on there yeah so you smoke the cocktail that way. Oh, that's and if, super interesting. And if you want to do it, if you want to, if you, you can, this is how you do it at the bar. This is more for visual effect and for smell and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But you can also have a vacuum seal bag, put mm -hmm. the cocktail in there, smoke the wood, uh, blow the smoke in there, close it, vacuum seal it, and maybe put it sous vide, infuse it, or just let it, let it rest. And then it, you know, you smoke it for an hour. Wow. So the, yeah, the cocktail gets the, the, the flavor, flavor of the smoke. Of the smoke. And then you, you can use cinnamon, you can rosemary, you can use wood, you can any, anything dried that burns yeah. and tastes good. And then, yeah, it should taste good. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could use. So a chef and a, a bartender is, is very, very, there's a lot of similarities mm -hmm. there. And um, it reminds me of the, that you say, okay, the, normally the chef is not interacting with the customer directly. It reminds me of the the you know the the Japanese type of restaurants. Huh? The um, God, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong. Teppanaki, yeah, teppanaki yeah, 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 yeah. style, where the chef is literally cooking yeah. right in front of you, yeah. um, and, and performs a few tricks as well. So yeah. like, I thought, ah, okay, this this could be a bit more. It's, it's like that. It's like that. And I I always for me bartending, and that's why. Another reason why I like that mixo don't like the mixology term mm -hmm. because there's way more to it. I can make you an average drink, but create the best experience you've ever had. Um, fun, uh, knowledgeable, great service, and you have a great night. 
you'll come back for that. Right. You'll tell everybody I did. I can even make that mediocre drink taste amazing. Right. But if I have a great tasting drink, but there's no experience and you sort of have a boring night, but with a ta great tasting drink, you'll go to another bar. Right. And um, often, you, and this is also what we did in the men, we created... Um, we created an experience and, and that experience is, is because if you would have had the same drinks, but it would have been in a very sterile atmosphere where we put a, would have put the drinks through a, um, through a sort of a, a, a small open window. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> the drink, like a vending machine. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't have had the same experience. Yeah, no, and sure and this is where, this is where bartending, um, becomes tricky because you don't, it's not only about taste, knowledge, education. So you got to understand how you pair flavors and how you mix them. But it's also about being a great host, mm -hmm. uh, about being a fun personality, knowledgeable. I always train my bartenders to read the newspaper, to be able to talk about different things with the guest. And you have to do that five nights a week, no matter if you had a bad day, because if then you're just rude, you know, if you had right. a bad day as yeah. a bartender, you're not funny. Yeah. Let's say you come to me three nights in a row and you had the greatest night. And then the fourth night, well, I had a very tough day plus four, not three. And I'm not as entertaining anymore. Plus the guests are getting a little bit tipsy. It's crazy. It's two or no, two o'clock in the morning and you close and they don't want to leave. And then you still have to be that entertaining host So that that's sort of maybe the difference with the kitchen as well, because mm. at the kitchen, you, if you have a grumpy day, there's a bit more separation, no. right. but not in a Tepanaki yeah, restaurant. Not, or but <laughs> there, well, I, there was not much conversation going on when, when, so when I was there, I was, uh, where was that? I think I was in, uh, in Los Angeles at that moment. And then when I went to that type of restaurant, it was just a conversation between the the, like me and my friends okay. and the chef was cooking in front of us and was performing these tricks but there wasn't really any type of okay hey, how's your day going and okay. there was no bar yeah. tender type of conversation yeah. it was purely focused on the cooking that was going on in front of us and the tricks that were performed yeah. but there wasn't much other deeper social interaction so yeah. i would say yeah i think for the bartender has a harder job there yeah, or it, it dep I think you have to be a certain personality to be able to be a bartender. And if you are that personality, it comes natural because yeah. you enjoy that. Uh, the problem is not five nights a week. Yeah. And that's, that's where it becomes tricky. That's when tricky. the work comes in. And, and this is also, and this is a danger in our profession. And I, I wrote an article on my website about um, uh, drinking mm -hmm. um, because it's, you know what what bar owners they they realize that and what they see it and then often to get you sort of over that bump they they offer you a shot or, or alcohol or guests offer you a shot and and this is also why some bartenders started drinking because or even worse drugs is a problem as well oh. because that keeps you keeps you going and that's a big threat to our profession and i would at my bar at the mom when it was very busy, very it has been very busy. Everybody has been exceeding. Um, I believe we would close. Well, there was no closing time, but if we would close at two and everybody was sort of it was quieter at one thirty, I would offer the team a little shot or a drink. But mostly we didn't do that. Yeah. And nowadays you see bartenders just being sort of drunk or high on drugs uh, because it's so difficult to keep on going. Yeah. And I always advise my um, my clients to do uh, not five nights, but four nights, maybe a little longer shift or make 36 hour contracts instead of 40 because mm -hmm. it's it's so demanding. Uh, yeah. And it, do it does make a difference. I mean, if you and it, it hampers, it dampens basically the experience the customer in the end ex exactly. gets. And that's what I try to to explain to my clients as well. So they say, yeah, but then I need more staff and then then I, it costs me money and um, 36 hours and do I have to pay them for 40? I said, this will always benefit you because of what you say. Yeah. People come back from that bartender and you almost need to do it like croupier in the casino where they mm. have to be changed yeah. every yeah, yeah. At, on the table every two hours or something. Right. 
for a different reason. For a different reason. But technically, you would like to have a set of bartenders that you you do two hour shift and then you go in the back, chill a bit, and then yeah. you keep on rotating. So there's always somebody that's that's, that's fresh and fresh energy, and full yeah. of energy and energy. Yeah, exactly, full of energy without yeah. having to drink fifty Red Bulls. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, because it's such an unhealthy profession, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, you're exposed to all these things while you see, no. uh, you, you want your customers to enjoy it. No. And then I, I think it's a very, it can be a very slippery slope because you're so exposed to it thinking, ah, what, what's the harm just a little bit now. No. And then before you know it, no. one week has passed and it's a little bit every day. It's a little bit every day. And yeah. then, yeah. And guests offer you right? Shot. And yeah. how, how do you, do you refuse that? that? Yeah, because that's rude. That? Yeah. Well, I, I would say, oh, that's very kind of you. I'll take one after work. Or what we had, we, you know, I I had a bottle of just water. Yeah. And I said that it's vodka, my own bottle. Or, or I would have um, um, water and I added some Angostura bitters in there to make it look like a, a very light rum right. or something. Right. So there's tricks. Or, you know, when, when a, if, if they're a little bit drunk, when you do shot. The moment your ha your hat when you shoot it, yeah. put your hat back, yeah. and that's where they don't see you. So you just then throw ah, away, or see. away a shot or anything. But there are owners that push you to do it because the guest pays for it, so it's revenue. It's re ah, and that's that's where it's well, that's the that's slippery the slope slippery you were talking slope. about. Yeah, but um, so it's um it's a big thing now as well in the in the bar scene together with with f food, sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, but also back problems and neck problems. So there's a right. lot of it's. We are uh, developing. It's a young, a relatively young profession again. Like really, the cocktail started. Uh, really, the bartending, the high end bartending, started again in two, 2000, second golden age of the cocktail, what we call it. Right. Um, but we're learning now, and now you sort of see that first, second generation of bartenders that started again with making cocktails. And I'm not talking about flair tending like the Tom Cruise uh, cocktails yeah. or the Sex on the Beach. Right. But really the, but and you see that my generation we encounter physical problems, so we really focus on that. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, oh, that's important. Topic. I mean, honestly, Absolutely. I had no idea. I was oh. just uh, um, a, a good friend of mine. <clears throat> he has a. Um, um, he, it's not that he owns a bar, but he's uh, having. Um, event he's offering event services no. and he has lots of drinks at his place um and when i visited him he asked me hey, what would you like to drink i make you whatever you want and so I, I i don't remember what i said but he made it and i realized he just made one glass and then i asked him what well, aren't you going to have one with me and he said no i'm not i'm not drinking yeah. Yeah. and i asked him why not <clears throat> Excuse me, and he was basically re explaining to me exactly the scenario that no. you're explaining. It's that slippery slope, and no. he was afraid that if he even allows himself a little bit, no. that he might get sucked into somewhere where he doesn't want to be, um, which then hampers his business, no. the the service he offers, and so on and so on. That he said it's much easier for him to just say none at all. None at all. I've seen a lot of bar owners making that mistake getting high in their own supply yeah and well when i was 27 it was my bar we had 300 bottles on the back right. bar oh yeah well you've seen my 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 liquor room downstairs i, I, have. I, I have 300 bottles down i never drink mm -hmm. at home not a, a single drop and you have to be strict mm -hmm. because it's so easy to just have one yeah. And with, you know, you're at your own bar and somebody offers you a whiskey and you take a cocktail and a beer and then, all right, it's just three drinks, but it's a Tuesday. And, you know, that's, that's how it starts. And I know a lot of bar owners that, and they don't, for them, it's normal because uh, bartending could also, it, you can be a functioning alcoholic. Yeah. Um, because your shift starts at eight. Uh, so you have to show up at work at seven yeah, and you go on till three and then you start drinking till five, six in the morning, but you just have to wake up at three again. So exactly. nobody notices yeah. it yeah, and yeah. people think it's normal, but a lot of people in the profession are actually, could be, according to the DSM, be diagnosed with alcoholism. Yeah. The only... It's the functional part. The functional yeah. part is is where, where they're not alcohol dependent. Yeah. 
but and that's the danger if they stop marketing for them to get back into sort of a normal nine to five job it's impossible yeah because then they'll you're basically uh, in the rut and you i mean uh, you were I think that's a slippery slope also with the DSM. It's that functional term. Yes. It's really, it's yeah. who defines that. And it, it just means, are you able to do the tasks that yeah. you have to do to um, earn a living? Yeah. That, or, I, th I think that's kind of all it well, is. Well, first, of course, the DSM <clears throat> and, and the whole whole psychology is normation, nor, norming. Yeah. So if, norm, yeah. And norming, what does more norming mean if society mm. doesn't really notice? Yeah. Then you're... Okay, then you're okay. to the norm. Yeah. If if society sort of sees it as a bit weird or it's disruptive, then there is an, a classification. And it makes total sense that it's yeah. that way. Yeah. But in this case, you see, well, there is, of course, a distinction between alcoholic and alcohol dependent. An alcoholic is, is just a number of, of so they're alcoholics, mm -hmm. but they're not alcohol dependent. Right. Hence, there is no need for them to be... Um, you know, going for treatment for treatment or, or anything, but I mean, if they, if they change their job, they will realize that they might be yes. actually alcohol dependent. Yes. And, and now we start seeing sort of the first examples in the cocktail scene, mm -hmm. because I'm saying that first, second generation, um, because it's also when you start, when you're 25, 26, it's fun when you're 30, yeah. it's still fun. Right. Yeah, your, body still it. your body can still take it. Your body can still take it. When you're 35, you know, a little less fun. <laughs> When you turn 40, like me, almost 40, well, then it's, then it's, it starts becoming pathetic. Yeah. And then when you're, and then at 40 and you see that realization with a lot of bartenders, like, right, I'm 10 years, I'm 50. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this for another 25 years till I get retired. I yeah. got to you can't you can't <laughs> you no physically can't. you can't <laughs> physically you just can't and this is this is also where i was talking about carrot and this is also where our industry needs improvement because mm -hmm. there's no educational system yet that that sort of um gives that 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 that, that possibility for for bartenders to at 30 or 35 say all right because as a bar manager you're still in the bar and um then you can become a bar owner <laughs> It's the same problem. You're in the bar and there's a constant supply of, al of, of alcohol. So what is, you can work for brands, but then well, you fly the whole world and mm -hmm. you drink everywhere. So is, is, there's a lot of things that we, uh, we still need to, uh, need to work on. It. So I can tell that your background in psychology actually must have helped you a lot seeing yes. all these things because yes. it's uh, um, no offense to anyone, right? But Knowing what the DSM is, having just the education right. of uh, of of a, <clears throat> of a bartender, mm. uh, I would not expect them to learn that. And uh, you knowing these aspects just makes you think about this slightly differently. Exactly, no, it's, it pays to do an education, kids. It's a it's a good example. Uh, I mean, even no, if absolutely. you don't end up in that yeah. in that in that profession, no. it doesn't mean that you haven't learned anything or that you can't no. apply it. And um, because of my education, I I can build my career path. Mm -hmm. Still being in the industry, but way less in the industry. I I built educational like a, like a bird's eye view almost. Yeah, and yeah. and and because of the psychology, I can build educational programs for hotel groups or brands or anything, and I can be. I have a nine to five job. Well, I travel constantly, but I do have a nine to five job that can give me more and more and more and more. I can, I, I can grow, but that's because of that education. And right. I'm fully aware that not everybody in the bar scene, but I do stimulate people in the bar scene to, um, at least think of it. Now it's fun. You're 25, you're 26. Of course it's fun, but get yourself educated, do an uh, online marketing course. I don't know, but yeah, you know, now it's so much more available than it used to be. It's I mean, no, there, there was no there. there was no Coursera in two thousand seven two thousand eight. <laughs> no, I just know. I just no. forget that that didn't exist. No, exactly. It's way it, it's way easier, and I think that this is also where employers should have because it's also no bar will have sort of a amount of money available for their staff for training or education. But a lot of companies they do that. They do that. Yeah, they do that. They have a a small jar for, for money if you want to get educated. Yeah. I think if bars do that as well, 
Uh, one of my clients does it and they also, because I sometimes say, well, if we, if we do this now, you know, we educate them, they might leave the bar. And, and that hotel group says, yes, we want that because we want them to grow into their career. We don't want them to stay with us in this role for 10 years. We want them to grow. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. But that's one out of a very few. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say, I mean, honestly, whoever has helped me in my career path with training or their time for giving advice, I do not forget that at all. And I will, I will do anything I can still to, uh, to promote those people or send anyone that asks me for where can I do this and this to those people. Exactly. Because I know they will be taken care of. Plus it's, uh, it's the, from the perspective of those people putting that investment in, it shows that it will pay off. If, right, exactly. if you do your job right, if you do it right, if you just treat the treat the investment as an yeah, yeah, 50 euros, leave me alone, yeah. well, you're not going to get that. No. But if you if you put in the care, I think it will pay off on the long run. I, I yeah, absolutely, as, absolutely, and and especially <clears throat> in industries where there is so little little attention and little focus on education right then there it pays off there yeah. you can and, and and we need that in the bar industry yeah no i, I can see that and then also with the, what you mentioned before it's not just training i guess for how to make cocktails i guess it's also the training for um what what is around the just the recipe of the cocktail no. is the the um the showmanship I would no. say the the conversation, and so you are now also a global judge for the Bulls around the world competition. Yes, right? which is it next week? The final two weeks in two weeks. Yeah, uh, so Getting we're close. We, yeah, we're recording this in uh, beginning of June. So in two yeah. weeks, uh, it's the world finals in Amsterdam. Yeah, and correct. what I thought was very interesting is that you you uh, in a in a call to the participants, you mentioned that you want to see more rituals, ritual of the creation of the cocktail. No. And, and I guess this has to do with you already knowing that there's just so much more to the cocktail experience than no. just the cocktail. Yeah, absolutely. People and, come back for a ritual. And, and I mean, how do, you, how do you think these specific rituals, so with ritual now, I mean the the, the making the cocktail um how do you think experiencing that as a guest and now I'm, I'm i'm asking again for your psychological psychology background um impacts that experience because i know so i, I i'm sure you know of these studies which I, I i was fascinated by so i used to drink a lot of wine yeah i, I mm -hmm. used to love wine now i barely drink anything anymore just I don't know. It just faded, kind of. We're getting uh, old. Yeah, we're getting. <laughs> I, I guess that's it. So it's it's like it it goes with the age, yeah. just as we. Um, but what I there was this one study, and I just two studies actually, and I just couldn't believe what came out. They gave a glass of white wine and a glass of red wine to a professional sommelier. They blindfolded him or her, and they were at a 50% chance guessing if this was red or white wine. I, it's blue, it blew my yeah. mind. It yeah. blew my mind. I couldn't believe this. Yeah. Uh, be, and because the sommelier training is hardcore. Yeah. It's really hardcore. And it blew my mind. And then there was another study where they had, to, to just average guests, they poured exactly the same wine, but one the customer paid more for, and one was they paid less for. No. But it was exactly the same yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And it impacted how people tasted no. it. But it's the same as um, if you buy a pair of Nikes versus a pair of non-branded shoes and you go running on them, the Nikes are always better. It's just a perception. Yeah. But it's the and, and that's but how do you play with that in that scenario? Do do you play with that? Absolutely. And that's why I, I said earlier on, I a mediocre drink can become a great drink yeah. if there is the whole experience and ritual experience is is is, is, is what we call it but if um, if let's say a chef you go into a kitchen and he's making his recipe from a 
a, a cookbook, mm -hmm. well, you immediately think that won't be a good recipe because a chef needs to be an expert. And if you take that to the complete other side, if you see a bartender with amazing skills showing you amazing evening, telling you about the history of this, of the spirits, the way it's produced, um, why they mix it with that, um, you know, in your head, you, you give them that expert role and, and an expert can only make a good product. Like a, an expensive wine can only be better than a cheaper wine because you you paid more for it, so mm -hmm. probably that process has been. Um, and That's always the assumption, right? That's always, always the, assumption. the assumption. And for instance, I have a, a client in, um, in, uh, in in Luxembourg, mm -hmm. and uh, they opened eight years ago, put cocktails on the menu there. I was there for the opening, and we did the cocktails, and it didn't work after a, after a half a year. Uh, 10 euros he asked for the cocktails. Then he upped the price still 15 euros. <clears throat> Now everybody, because Luxembourg <laughs> is champagne oh, country oh, and so yeah. like that. So it's just a value that people. It's the value. It's and it's not only that they think, oh, this might be good, but it's yeah. also like or the the expected value, basically. The right? expected value, yeah. yeah. But it's also that that um, if something is cheap, it cannot be good. That's so imprinted it's in so our imprinted. in our head. And I do the same if I if I buy headphones, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something I don't, I'm not really knowledgeable in headphones. Um, I go to the shop and um, I buy the most expensive noise cancellator because I think, well, and they're good, obviously. They're good, yeah. But are they the best on the market? I wouldn't know. Yeah. I wouldn't know. So if you if you go into the whole experience, the whole ritual, and the ritual, I'll tell you why we're looking for a ritual. There's a slightly different sort of reason why okay. we're in that case. We're well, looking tell for me, a ritual. tell me. So think of the tequila. Yeah. Uh, we know the tequila ritual, basically made for disguising the badly mixed dough. So not the 51% the agave tequila and the rest is cheap sugar distillate, molasses distillate. Uh, whereas you have 100 agave tequila, 100% that we barely have here in the Netherlands. But it's super expensive. It's super expensive, it's but it's worth expensive. the investment. I agree. That is, I agree. This is a, I agree. But it's this is expensive. Investment. Um, because of the, the, the agave has to be cut yeah. by hand, yeah, it has yeah. to be roasted. It's it all the manual it's... labor that goes into it. Exactly. Yeah. So you pay for that. But the ritual is basically to, to do the salt. So you first do the salt. Well, what does salt do? It sort of takes away the water. Mm -hmm. the, and on your tongue, there's the epitol cells mm -hmm. that open when their water hits it. That's why we produce saliva mm -hmm. when we get mm -hmm. hungry. So the salt takes away sort of the saliva, the water on your tongue, let's call it that way. So the epithel cells don't really open when you put the tequila on there. And then as fast as possible, you take lemon. Yeah. That's it. But that's the, uh, the, the background of the, 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 the thought behind the ritual. But that ritual caused such a massive, massive growth in volume of tequila sales. People like rituals. Mm -hmm. It's the whole, everything that has a ritual is, is important. A drinking ritual is something that a brand is looking for. So if you can invent your new drinking ritual, you can potentially create big, big volumes. In the Netherlands, we have the Kopstootje, your neighbor in beer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, it's a ritual. <clears throat> There's, um, this is interesting. So this reminds me of the... Uh, the IKEA effect. Have you have you heard of that? Uh. So the IKEA effect is basically the idea that whatever well, it's not an idea. So it's it's a bias, mm -hmm. and um, it basically means that if you put work into something, it becomes more valuable. And I'm saying uh. IKEA uh, uh, a bias, IKEA effect because you are building your furniture yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. the part where um kind of it has been ritualized by ikea as yeah. well and it has been hugely successful yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously that and, and i find this quite interesting is that i never thought of something like that in a cocktail environment or in a beverage environment but it makes total sense what you say you yeah. do a little bit uh adding to your experience um as well which then most mm. likely makes it well it not only does it make it more fun uh, 
Well, no, no it's, yeah. it's, it, it makes it more fun, and that fun transmits into into the value you you attribute to this beverage yeah. or what whatever you're consuming at that moment. And I can tell you, the Americans are crazy when it comes to these rituals. Yeah. When I was in Texas, um, uh, what was that street called? Oh, it was in Austin. Oh God, I can't believe I forgot the name of that street. Sixth Street. I've not but, yet been to Austin, but. but Wherever you walk into a bar and you order some type of cocktail, it yeah. comes with some type of game. Yeah. And um, yeah, so to, to anyone listening in Austin, order a blue wave. You see what I mean? But it's the same in New Orleans. Wow, now I forgot the name. What, what's up? But it's it's very fair. I go to New Orleans every year. It's a big cocktail fair and it's not a grenade. It's... Um, well, it's just a big glass. Everybody drinks it on Bourbon Street, and yeah. it's a ritual. Yeah. And and um, what's what's very trending now in in cocktail world, and I'll be in right after Bulls Around the World. I'm going to Negroni Week in the United, in the States. Oh wow! Um, Where, where's that going to be? All over the states. So all I'll over. be doing three cities in six days, I believe. All oh over. my Washington, god! Washington D.C., Tampa, and Chicago. So it's everywhere, but it's uh, it's okay. Wow. Um, but um, we're gonna serve a red light Negroni. I lived in Tampa. Day. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I live in Tampa. No, but All please right. continue. Right. It's just interesting I'm, that you say Tampa. I'm curious. I can't wait for the good weather there. But, um, <laughs> no, we served a red light Negroni in a red light bulb, in a light bulb. And from the bulb, they put the, we served a bulb with a glass and guests pour the red light Negroni over ice themselves. Huh. Just that simple yeah. pouring. Yeah. That's, that's the experience. It's the experience. And that's why we are looking for an experience. And the ritual is more, well, that's the same actually. It's, mm -hmm. and, and an experience um, gives people a, a, good, a good feeling, so to say. Um, well, which, it's, also, it's, also it's also a sense of ownership. Right. Yeah, sense of ownership. Sense of no, ownership. exactly. Yeah. The sense of ownership that gives them a good feeling. Yeah, yeah. Because exactly. that good feeling is what yeah. we what we want. That that positive, that positive emotion about their experience that makes them come back. Yeah, and yeah exactly. It's very e people don't, you know, spreading a positive message is well. People do that, but not too often. A negative message is spread to everybody, mm -hmm. but we want to to create those positive. Um, Association. Association. And then, yeah. for instance, um, Bacardi had um, the commercial for the mojito. Yes. Tum, 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 yes. Tum, tum. Was it was it a that? great commercial, I have to say. Yeah, but everybody was getting the muddler and doing tum, making mojitos at yeah. home and completely yeah. ruining the mint. You should never muddle mint, but that's a different thing. Bacardi. But tum, 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 tum. I think it was that song. Yeah, it was that. And even when I was bartending, tum, tum, or... Um, well, now luckily they don't ask it, but in the 95, 96, when I started barting, oh, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, that's the experience is showing up. Yeah. The drink could be bad, but you know, that's, it's the whole, the whole thing around it that, and then indeed for the, for the, for the uh, ritual could be, it's, it's also part ownership uh, that you own the ritual, that you do it yourself and that makes them come back. And uh, the reason why we do want that with with bulls is that there's a lot of brands on the market, yeah. And you got to stand out. Yeah, you got to stand uh, out. Bulls Bulls is actually very good at it. It's a, it's a small Dutch brand, but we're very good at um, at standing out. And um, a ritual and ex an experience is part of that. And if we as as a brand in this case, if Bulls as a brand can help a bar owner with that experience, the bar owner is helped. Yeah. Of course. And here goes that. And gets education. And gets education. And gets education. Yeah. And here goes that 8, 12% revenue again. You know, all those little things are important for a bar owner. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Oh, that's interesting that you mentioned that. I never thought about it this way. This is, uh, well, I'm definitely going to look <laughs> at cocktails very differently now. Yeah, it's the whole, we don't have to, sh yeah, well, you have to shake a cocktail, of course, yeah. but there's a whole, the whole ritual in making the cocktail and letting guests experience it. And it's even more powerful if you, well, okay, how do I say this without, if you give them the idea that they've made the cocktail themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so tailor made cocktails, guests come back for their own cocktail. If you help them together with them, you create a cocktail. Mm -hmm. So if you take them on a journey, they'll come back. You'll have a, you have guests for life. Yeah, and that's that's the yeah exactly that the ownership. And is there 
I mean, well, okay, you mentioned now a lot of things. You mentioned the ritual part. You mentioned um, the specific aspect of what salt does and why in that, in that <laughs> tequila drinking ritual, why you lick that first, then comes the shot, then comes the lemon? Yeah, lemon. Lemon, Yeah, okay. with the, the huge acidity which blows away all the flavor yeah. anyway. And with these, I mean... What you explained to what you said to me when it came to what the salt does sounded super scientific. Do you do you use these specific parts that you know to design specific rituals exactly in this manner? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, in a sense, you you, you try to do, but the pro and here comes the problem: a ritual. You never know why a ritual is a ritual for the tequila, but a ritual should also be. Uh, stupidly simply yeah, simple, stupidly simple and, yeah. and if you if you overthink things it becomes too difficult so there that's where science sort of stops but yeah you, you can use for instance uh, in in upsell training we we use several uh, scientific principles like the chameleon effect would Tell you like me. to have another beer Oh. Yes, you like, so you're not, and so then you're the not while you're asking. Yeah, exactly. And if you do that the first time, so they had a beer, and when it's almost done, you ask, "Would you like another beer?" And then the third time, you just nod and say, "Beer," and uh. they say, "Yeah." Fourth time, you just nod. The fifth time, you you only have to blink your eyes, and so you keep on selling that extra beer, or the primacy recency. Yeah. So if you want to sell a certain product, you can use primacy recency, where if the the decision have to be made straight after your what you you know what you tell them then you use the recency effect if there's a little waiting time you use privacy so if you show them the menu and you have a big group and one says oh can you help me i have to think maybe maybe and then you say okay well we have blah 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 and you say what you want to sell first and then later you come back so there are small little things that you can use um, in, in that. But there's also bartenders that um, want to measure the signs of dilution. Dilution. So when you stir a drink, how much it dilutes. Oh, okay. And then they say, well, if you stir it like that with that amount of water, and they test it in their bar, and they try to use those results, but they're not copy-pastable, applicable mm. on other situation because... Uh, humidity, temperature, uh, temperature of ice, stuff like that. So in that sense, it's difficult to use, um, so to use science. These, these scientific concepts then, mm, so for me, it sounded like, okay, you described now two different camps. One is more the camp of scientific concepts that, that you can take from decision-making, mm -hmm. the, the chameleon mm -hmm. effect, primacy, recency, oh. Ikea effect, wh whichever yeah. one it is. Yeah. Um, and the other one is more trying to get these cocktails as accurately yeah. reproducible as yeah. possible. And that's where bartenders try to use a lot of science where it's, in my opinion, never applicable. I see. Um, and also because, well, if it's always the same dilution, then you serve it to the guest, but the guest will never taste it as in a experimental environment right the guests will taste it while having conversation listening to music not focused at all yeah. and then yeah that's what i mean i mean there are so many more <coughs> you also mentioned there's so many more factors involved yeah. into the taste exactly. the, ex the experience let's say let's be let's be uh precise in the experience of the taste yeah rather than just the ingredients of the cocktail exactly and those other factors are often more controllable per se yeah than having to have 22.5 milliliters dilution in your cocktail you yeah. can't control that yeah but you can control a lot of other faction factors like experience like temperature like uh, volume of music like tempo of music like all these things that you can do that that add up to the experience okay so this this i find very interesting because for me this was exact this was where i wanted to go it's just wondering what concepts are used in in bartending where you think um okay maybe these should be scientifically tested in the first place or which concepts Ooh. are taken from um 
from like a scientific method, like the, the mm-hmm. making it super precise, but completely leaving out that this is not a lab environment. No, and yeah. therefore we should not look at just the recipe, but actually all the other things which would be so much more effective to control, easier to control and cheaper to control. Yeah. 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 There's the, 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 so, so, um, ice is something that, that, that people always want to talk about scientifically ice and so, but there's, you know, there's so much different in, in, well, um, calcium in ice, so all the components in water, for instance, but ice is something bartenders always want to, um, scientific ice. How do you call it? Make scientific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make it scientific. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, then, then, then the, the, the uh, temperature, vo- volume of music, stuff like that. These are for me the interesting things that you should check, like um, beats per minute in mm-hmm. music. That's what I would check. Yeah. Temperature, colors, uh, even the way a bartender looks could, you know, um, influence what what you drink. Yeah. Uh, the way they approach you, um, what they say, what they say, and very, very important menu design. Menu I, design. I was is about so, to ask you. Yeah. Uh, it's so, tell me, tell me. Well, first of all, bartenders and cocktail makers they want to uh, write all the ingredients. People don't care. People, uh, the average guest doesn't even know what angostura is. Doesn't care that you use a. A, a certain vermouth from a certain region and that you have this very rare Japanese, they want to know flavors. Mm. But a lot of menus have 60 drinks on there. This is ridiculous. So, so they basically go, give you a book. <laughs> yeah, because only, only one third of your guests um, uh, order from the menu. There's a lot of research done on that. So average okay. 33%. The rest, yeah. People, the majority of people come into the bar and say, can I have a beer? Can I have a Coke? Can I have a mojito? Mm -hmm. And this is where you should train your staff. This is your first experience moment, your upsell. All right. Oh, you'd like to have Coke? Well, we make our own homemade soda. Maybe you'd like to try that. Experience starts. Mm -hmm. Um, Or, oh, your beer? Well, we have several beers. Well, if you want to make money, you say, well, we have, if you have a good deal on, let's say, Heineken, mm-hmm. Dutch, we say, we have Heineken, we have Grols, we have Bavaria, uh, we have an IPA, but we also have Heineken. All right, there you go, they'll probably take Heineken. And then while they have it, you say, okay, we also have a cocktail menu with 10 cocktails where you put them on the right, because that's where they start reading. Uh, what they also w- always want to do is cheapest and then go down on the price and that's stupid. Yeah. So just put them on top one or two expensive one to make the other look cheaper. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it's also, I don't know uh, the name of it, but for instance, when, when you would go to a supermarket mm-hmm. and you can choose a five or 10 euro or a uh, five or 10 euro wine for a dinner party. A lot of people take that sort of the five because the 10 is quite expensive. But if you do a five, 10 and 15, everybody takes the 10. Um, you can apply that on your cocktail menu yeah. as well. Um, signs behind the bar, the way you 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 um, you display the, you display your bottles, the bottles, yeah. And the, and then all those things and the way your guest talk to your uh, your your bartender talks to your guest and the way the bartender interacts. That's way more important than the dilution of ice or. Um, the way you dash your bitters or, you know, all these things that people want to, want to, again, make scientific. Because if we start with ice, you got to start with water. And water is differently everywhere here right. in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is different than Nijmegen. Right. So that influences both the uh, speed of dilu- dilution, but definitely the taste. Yeah, so, definitely. You know why focus on those very small, small little details? And um, I would, yeah. There are th- a lot of things that come from our science, from psychology, that you yeah. can actually apply and and use. Yeah, but that's beautiful. I think that's yeah. so beautiful. And I have not. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 actually super interesting that you bring up music because in the previous uh, session I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Erwin de Boer, 
and he is a, a sound designer and right. uh, so he makes um oh man i hope i get this right um <laughs> he's not listening no he if will you're be. listening he, Irvin, sorry <laughs> yeah so, sorry uh, um damn it a sonic house style type okay so for brands how they should sound and okay. we were also talking about um i was specifically i i asked him specifically about music in restaurants because i'm an audiophile i like good music and i like high quality of that music yeah. now i spend a lot of time figuring out what's the best uh, headphones and all this stuff but that i like that yeah so when i'm in a restaurant and the music is a little too loud i get annoyed super fast yeah, 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 i get very very fast yeah, yeah, yeah. and and nobody else seems to mind no. and, no. and it's it's I find that's so interesting that you should bring up the BPM yeah. as, a, as yeah, very yeah. specifically even. So volume is more difficult than BPM. Because for instance, if I go into a shopping street, mm -hmm. a big shopping street, or Amsterdam, Kalverstraat, or Nijmegen, you have the Burgstraat, I believe. Right. Every, every city has a big shopping street. Often you have this hip, young shops where sometimes even a DJ is playing with very loud music. That's well, exactly I what would, I think, I, I'm, you know, I would never enter that ever entered a shop oh. yet it's full of people yes that's right so so volume you know in a loud bar if i'm in a loud bar i'll tell my friends shall we go somewhere else and i'll say no it's nice here there's very but what we can say and there's there's also research in that is that certain, like beat per minute is very important yeah, in a important. if you play slow jazz music people drink slower automatically because you have a glass of whiskey that's, that's you order a type of drink in a jazz bar they have chesterfield chairs and you sit down and then you listen to um, miles Davis. well Miles Davis is not too slow but like really slow jazz and you're like mm, take a sip but it literally whiskey. sets the tone right? it literally. sets the tone but also your also heart beat drops yeah and, I, and drinking tempo is very related to heartbeat as well it's mm -hmm. the same as bartending if yeah. you free pour you count your heartbeat and oh. really yeah free pouring is not using a jigger but yeah. just using the bottle yeah and counting often you use your heartbeat as a reference so if it's very quiet and you relax you go like one two three four but if it's busy yeah. and, and or you're stressed in a competition one two three four blah. so if you want to have a good measure of whiskey always ask are you a relaxed bartender no, okay, and then go to the next part and <laughs> order with them if they're free. But and but there is sort of a sweet spot of beats per minute. I don't know the exact number, but because if you go to a techno party mm -hmm. with very high BPM, boom, 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 they're not per se gonna drink faster because there is a point where you start feeling uncomfortable. Right. right. And but there is a sort of a BPM yeah. ideal spot. Yeah. Maybe so it's, it's like an like an inverted U shape, basically, right? It does yeah. go up, but as soon as you go over it, it goes back down. Yeah, and then I, I you know, uh, you should look. You can look into it, but that that sweet spot is where you wanna, where you wanna be with your music, and um, where you, and then volume is very much. Well, I I like lower mm -hmm. volume, and I think you should. I think this is very much related to target group. Right. I think if you have an older target group, us or even older, because a lot of bar owners or restaurant owners forget the sort of 55, 65 plus group, which is actually the most interesting group. And and I, is, I mean, if you think about it, uh, economic wise, economic wise, they yeah. they have the most to spend. You, they're I think. willing to spend, and they're and they're willing yeah, to spend. Kids, exactly. Yeah. Kids are out of house. Yeah. University college has been paid for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all taken care of. They got their pension. They they're not worried about it anymore. Actually, they think let's spend it because you know it's I'm time building. to enjoy. <laughs> it's time, it's to, time enjoy. to enjoy. It's a very very interesting group, but they don't want loud volume. But if you start going for a younger target group, which probably the clothing shop that we mentioned goes for yes for sure <laughs> uh, it's not me that they are aiming for but if you go for a younger audience yeah then you should maybe go higher in volume yeah. that also goes for a bar if you want to if you're if you have a shot bar yeah loud music high bpm yeah yeah i mean it's in tune 
it's <laughs> I think that's the important part that you mentioned that it's in tune with the um, offering or let's say the, the primary offering of that bar if oh. you have let's say techno music or something with higher BPM and you have a shot bar it fits perfectly no. fast music um, talking quick shots keep no. talking another quick shot no. but if you have a uh, okay, I'm exaggerating now but let's say a 40 or 50 year old aged whiskey you don't want to just shut no. that down well, maybe as a bar owner, you would <laughs> like them to shut it down, yeah. but it's not meant to be shut down no, at all. No. It doesn't fit no, yeah. the, It doesn't fit no. that same experience that you exactly. would normally attribute to it. And and the bar owner will adjust price anchor, price point mm -hmm. um, to drinking tempo. Because if you, it's like you don't sell a very expensive BMW cheaply because you sell a couple a year. Uh, so you, if, if you have a jazz bar, you will have a slightly average higher price point, so bigger margin. Mm -hmm. In shots bars, often they have a, a slightly little, a less margin because they they are going for the volume. Yeah, yeah, um, it's like mass market versus premium type. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that, yeah. that goes for a bar as well. That goes for yeah. bars as well. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, in, in in general, but in an average bar, if they have, they, they might also choose to make the very expensive products are slightly cheaper to get more volume in there. But then the goal is volume. Yeah. And if you want people to really enjoy with good food in a Michelin star restaurant, that's why they're so expensive. That's why it's so it, expensive. It takes longer. Yeah. So you are a bit more expensive. Yeah. And if you want them to have dinner a little bit longer and really enjoy and get that extra cognac, yeah, then you put lower music. Probably the restaurant where you think that the music is too loud, they want to have three or four coverings off their seats, so they push you. Uh, yeah, I guess. I, I, I guess so. But I've I've been wondering about this because when I was at restaurants, and so I mentioned this in in my conversation with Aaron as well. When I was at restaurants that actually had excellent music choice and volume, I like to compliment them on this. And then yeah. they are they they are very first they are very surprised because they think uh, yeah. you would normally compliment them on the food. So I just, yes, of course the food was great, but what really stood out was your music choice. Uh, so they don't expect that, and then they normally <laughs> they normally just look at me like a weirdo, like what's what's this weirdo talking about music? And then uh, and then they they reply simply by saying, "Oh, this is just some Spotify playlist." Yeah, 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 and yeah, that yeah. makes me wonder: is that if where it is good, it's just good by accident, it makes me wonder if a lot of other places where it's bad, maybe it's just bad by accident. Not so this is just really don't care. I, th I think there's not a lot of bar restaurant owners that look into music. Yeah. They have a playlist, a Spotify playlist. And it could be that in that restaurant that the person you asked just put on a Spotify playlist that had been made with a thought behind it. I hope but so. I'm quite sure that it's it's hardly ever ever that that idea. And if I look at the mall, I had my playlist. The playlist was great, and, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I try to Excellent. adjust I try to adjust and play with that and also with volume. Mm -hmm. Um but I'm pretty sure that my staff would have just told you it's just a playlist. Right. I, so, I, I happened to ask the owner. So he also said it was just oh, a yeah? playlist. Okay, okay. Uh, and then uh, that case, no, they don't look in that. The, yeah, the, yeah, maybe it's his personal flavor to, or, or I don't know. Yeah. But but you, I think you can make money if you design a a, a playlist scientifically sort of structured. Yeah. And then because it's also time of the night in exactly. a bar, you know, exactly. you want to start. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. You never want to start too slow. Yeah. Exactly. Because even if you open at eight, even at eight, you want people to. But if you have some open seats, mm -hmm. right, you can go a bit slower. Yeah. Right? But the moment you see that people go away because there's no free space, whoop, put those beats per minute up and there you go. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, I mean, whenever I was throwing a party, for me, the most important thing was the music because I knew this was going to drive everything else. It's going to yeah. drive the conversation. It's going to drive the movement and it's going to drive the consumption. Yeah. Um, not that I was so happy about the consumption because I was paying for it, but I wanted my guests to always have a good time. Yeah, yeah. So then of, maybe I went a bit overboard with overanalyzing this, but then I thought, okay, people come at eight, nobody will start dancing at eight. I, I would be the only one. So 
we start slower and over time the BPMs move up, huh. move up, move up until roughly mm, nine, quarter past nine, because at that point people would have had two beers, three beers for sure, maybe a, a higher spirit type of drink, which they drank slowly. But at that time, thresholds would have been reduced. Um, what does alcohol do? You start to drink a little bit, starts to elevate your heart rate, and then you can start to drop faster yeah. BPM, and then you get into the party type yeah. of dance scenario, which of course doesn't make sense for a cocktail bar, but that's how no, I was. Well, it depends on there's cocktail bars right, where you sure. want people to dance, but yeah. there's definitely cocktail bars where you want people to drink fast. Exactly. If you have people waiting. Yeah. And it's never a guarantee for success. No. But, but if you would look as a bar owner more into those details, mm -hmm. I think, I think because, um, there's sort of in, in bar, uh, Often it's said that you never know exactly why a bar is successful, mm -hmm. why this concept works and that concept doesn't work. People, but I do think if you look into all these things, you can sort of make the the ideal sort of Megatron bar that 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 could could potentially. Um, but then you have to look in every single yeah. detail. Yeah, yeah. And you and the biggest detail is. Yeah, it's 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 also it's the per the people, the staff, but you can even do you can, you can do personality tests, you 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 can do character tests, yeah. you can or the training of, for it, do training yeah, for it, but you yeah. can even if in hiring your staff and in bigger companies do that, huh? they want a all round team. Mm -hmm. So we did I forgot the name of it, but for instance, the one where you where you can be blue, green, orange. Uh, and that de describes your character and oh, okay. then in a certain team like a marketing team you want more blue and yellow mm -hmm. but in production team you want more orange or red people you could do that you could do you that. can do that behind the bar in the kitchen and on the floor if you look for a manager you know get it because especially in the bar scene oh manager's leaving oh okay we need a new manager oh that guy's a good bartender <laughs> you want to be a manager yeah of course i want to be a manager let's be a manager it happens or because you're not gonna in the bar scene they're not gonna hire a manager that comes from another profession right they will never say all right that's he's been managing a pet shop and he's been very successful he got the right numbers so let's get him into the bar no it should always be somebody working in the bar mm -hmm. where he is there's no real rationale behind it because it's just a familiarity I familiar guess. yeah and and I always confuse soft and hard skills, but you, you, you sort of hire them on, on experience. Like there's a good bartender, so he has ex experience, but you don't hire them on the hard skills, the, the, the skills necessary to actually manage a bar. Right. And in a sense, managing a bar could be the same as managing a pet shop. Yeah. Because you're yeah. the manager. Yeah. Yeah. The, but the, the product is different. The product is different. But principle wise, the same principles should apply. Yeah. And I'd rather have a manager that has to study on the product mm -hmm. to know the basics of the product. But then come from an outside perspective. Yeah, but be a great manager that yeah. knows how to, to calculate gross profit, how to work with that, how to do marketing, HR, stuff like that. Then having a manager that knows everything about cocktails, but knows nothing about how to manage people and all the aforementioned things. Yeah. Whoa. So we went through a lot of things that, that you also said that can be done. Color, music, <clears throat> excuse me, color, music, design in general. Um, if you had access to a research institute. Yes. Um, and they would, would look into anything you would want. What is something that you would like them mm. to figure out or to study? I would like them, what I would like to study is them to study is the ideal set of personal qu personality qualities. So make that sort of super bartender. Mm -hmm. So you can do a personality test because on your, on your, on your team, how to construct that ideal team. That's what, what, if I have to do one thing, I would pick that. Why? Because that makes the heart and soul of your bar. Mm. Um, and then obviously music and everything that we've already talked about. 
No, but it's interesting that you say that because in the end, that is irrespective of the music, irrespective of the bar design, you always have the human interaction. Yes. Always. Yes. And that can drive a lot. Yes, and sell a lot. And sell a lot. So it can it it can make sure that you sell these four, three, three cocktails an hour extra. It can make sure that guests have a great experience. So there's a lot of things that that those personality, yeah, that it can do. And then I, I would like to maybe look scientifically at your menu. So menu design, menu flavor, um, colors, temperature, setup of the bar. Um, so, yeah. but also type of type of furniture. There's so many things that that because people always say I want a lounge chair, like a, a, a chair that you. You can lean back on lean back or a sofa in the in a bar. Yeah, a lot of people like that. In Dema, the most popular was the, the the orange lounge sofa or the big chairs. But what do you get if people sort of hang in a chair, not in an active position? Tempo of drinking goes down. Yeah, if you're in an active position on a chair, you you drink faster. Now, of course, it's got to be comfortable. You mm -hmm. don't want to sit on a wooden bench, but still, even on a wooden bench, that's very hip now. But so, you know, those are also things that that I would I would definitely look, look into. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Because I'm not that I wouldn't be that interested in in again the delusion that the temperature of your cocktail, which is very important. But if it's one, two or three degrees Celsius, your drink after shaking, in the end of the day, that's important in a cocktail competition, but yeah. not per se for your bar experience. So acidity and lime, lemon juice, uh, how do you use that? All these things, how do I make clear eyes? It's not what I would focus on. Okay. So this is super interesting. So then my goal will be to find somebody who can look into these personality tests, somebody else who knows about decision making, so menu design structure. I have never thought about the impact of furniture design on behavior. No, yeah, absolutely. But now <laughs> I will definitely find someone absolutely. who can tell us about that. Yeah, but it's so... And, and it, it could be, and maybe, and, and that's the funny, and in a sense, it's a funny thing about, about a bar. We could look into all this, build a bar, and it could flunk, it could fail. I don't think it would, though. Yeah, I'm, I also I'm don't so, think I'm, I'm so, if you do it right, uh, I'm, so sh I'm so sure and confident about science that I, I think we can build that. Megatron bar is Megatron the correct word? Yeah, you know, I don't, I mean. like a I super bar. I don't know ultra who is bar, Megatron, but yeah, they're yeah, yeah. super. That's super. Oh, the ultra Megatron bar. was the bad guy from the Transformer. Damn, I knew but it. But doesn't doesn't matter. Thinking, doesn't who is the good guy from the Transformer? Uh, Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime. So you make an Optimus bar. Yeah, right? and then we call it Optimus Prime. Yeah, yeah definitely. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's funny because now and I see them more and more. Actually, the the bar that I did in the south of the Netherlands had it, a cocktail robots. Uh, more and more companies try to do that, uh, but they always fail because people miss that personal interaction. Yeah. You don't go to a bar to be for your product to be made by a robot. A robot. Yeah. And this also shows that all that science into making your drink or it doesn't show, but it also convinces me personally that all that science into making a cocktail, because what's more scientific in a sense than letting your drink be made by a machine. a machine. It doesn't get more accurate than that. It doesn't get more accurate than that. But people will not go to a bar where robots make your food and your machine, your yeah. cocktails. Yeah. You just don't do that. Yeah. So yeah, that's... Um, and if you if you think about... So this, I think... Uh, have you seen the movie Inter... Uh, no, no. What was it called? Passengers. No. Uh, so it was with Chris Pratt and... Um, uh, Jennifer Lawrence, oh, yeah, and okay. they're the only ones on the ship, and there is only one other, well, maybe I shouldn't call a person, but uh, one other humanoid to interact with, and that was the bartender. But oh, yeah. the bartender was a robot, but interacted with them just like a human would. It wasn't just a robot who mixed the cocktails and then yeah. said bye-bye actually you know had the conversations did the the shaking all right. and all of those things and i thought now that you say all these things 
it makes sense that if people don't want a cocktail experience or a higher quality beverage experience out of a vending machine. No, it just and no, that's no. that's the experience you would get no. if it's a robot doing it. In front but then of you have the also philosophical, philosophical or psychological discussion uh, whether the, the human is a robot or you know. Right. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's been a long time since yeah. I studied, right, so, right. so I forgot the name of no, it. No, 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 But problem. if you can make a robot like that in person, yeah. no, but definitely a machine, no. People don't pe people don't like their cocktails to come from a machine. Yeah. And it's also why I'm I'm really curious to see the if the if the ordering things at McDonald's, well, McDonald's you might not go for the experience, huh? But let's put there was an actually a restaurant in Nijmegen that wanted you to order via an iPad. Right. Where all your dishes were on an iPad. But that wasn't a takeaway or anything or a junk food restaurant. Yeah. It was a regular restaurant. It, it, I think it was there for six months. Yeah. It was on Plein Vida Vierta. Okay. And because people, you want to talk to your waiter. You want to get advised. You mm. don't want to order from a from an iPad. Yeah. Yeah. I think it really depends on what type of, uh, and, and again, I think mm. the, the target group, Yeah. What what you are offering yeah. is very important to have that in line, and yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. it's not just this one thing that's gonna yeah. cause this huge difference. Well, I think it's and that's uh, what we started discussion with. It's also very much your concept that's that's sort of deciding that, that sort of uh, decides where where to go to. Because on the airport, you, yeah, a lot of restaurants, especially in the states, you can order via iPad. Yeah. But on the airport, I wear my noise cancellator. I don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. And in the airplane, I yeah. don't want to go into the airplane. Yeah, exactly. As fast as possible. Yeah. That's, different environment. Different, different environment. Yeah. Makes yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. So the, the concept sort of decides. But yeah, I want. It would yeah. be fun to make. It would that, definitely uh, be fun. And I, I just want to be clear. So it's not that these biases or anything that we've been talking about always work 100%. So it's not about that. It's in the end, it's still humans you interact with, mm. but they they change the likelihood into your favor substantially. Exactly. And then it becomes a number. Exactly. Game. And I, I know, I don't know any of the results if they, they would work, but it would be interesting to look into for that sure. and to do sure. research on that. Yeah, for sure. Well, Ivar, thank you so much for taking the time. I... I learned a lot. Uh, it was a lot of fun for me. And you gave me an entire list of who I need to seek out next <laughs> so these people can answer your questions. <laughs> cool. Because, uh, so that's my, that's definitely the idea also of this oh, that's podcast. That's great. That's great. Um, so when people want to work with you and, or, or just reach out to you, where can they find you? So best would be on my website, ifardelange.com, this is my name, um, where I write about my project, but also of interesting things like peer pressure, for instance, uh, on bartenders to take shots, what we talked ah, yeah, about yeah, earlier yeah, on, yeah. and how to say no, uh, but also the sort of what uh, alcohol does to your body, but also about basil, mint, all these very various topics that could be interesting for, uh, for bartenders. Uh, my email address uh, is under both business as uh, private uh, as is my uh, phone number i think okay so that would be uh, would all be right easiest. no i'm gonna so nobody has to write this down to all the listeners it's going to be in the show notes as well all right good. you can just <laughs> click on the link and uh, and you can you can yeah. get to that website otherwise i would spell it e far de la no. <laughs> <laughs> no no worries i will spell it i will spell it yeah. for sure um No, hey, thanks again, Ifar, uh, for your pleasure. time. And Absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, to everyone who's listening, you have a great day. Hey, everyone. Just one more thing before you go. I hope you enjoyed the show. And to stay up to date with future episodes and additional content we share, you can sign up to our blog and you'd get an email every Friday. Why Friday? Because it's almost weekend and we want to give a fun end of the week bonus that you can also talk about during your Friday afternoon drinks. It'll be a short email with our latest updates about bridging the gap between science and UX. The content we share ranges from conversations between UX and science, like we have on this podcast, our own journey from scientists turning into entrepreneurs, all the way to our own studies where we dig deeper into concepts of UX. If you want to receive that to stay in the loop, sign up at mind-trace.com slash blog. M-I-N-D minus T-R-A-C-E dot com slash blog.